welcome everybody. There's so many visitors here, and well, you're not visitors. Came once you're at home, right? So last night we was uh, well, we've been working on the lesson all week, and was a few pages short, and I said, well, Lord, it's in your hands, and this morning you woke us up, and he gave us the rest of the story. So, I feel God has something for us, and if you uh, were in the middle of our series, bet it's okay. The way God gives us these lessons, it's, you're not missing out on anything, okay? So, uh, The Lord Great and Power is our series title. And uh, through the study of scriptures, we have come to witness God's boundless power. Uh, and he seeks to turn hearts towards him, doesn't he? We've learned this. In the book of Jonah, we see God as the uh, God of salvation. However, in the book of Micah, we find a just God who left his mercy seat to prepare a throne of judgment before rebellious nations of Israel and Judah. And I am going to talk quick, so you have to listen quick, because they have cut me 15 minutes short. <laughs> you know how I am. So I, I talk fast anyways, and now I'm talking really fast. So, but to put us all on the same page, just let me repeat just to get us to right where we're at, and God will lead us to the heart of the message. But Israel and Judah had... This wasn't just an overnight sin. They were practicing sin. They had been practicing sin and rebelling, purposely rebelling against God for several hundred years now. So God said, enough's enough. You know, when you do something wrong as a child, and your dad said, I've had enough, and he gets, gets up, you know you're in trouble. Well, God has gotten up. They have gotten the attention of God. The sins that were there were unfaithfulness towards God. There was idol worship, and not just idol worship, but they were professing God with the same mouth that they were uh, giving praise to these idols that man had created. So they had one foot in with God and one foot in with uh, idols, right? So there was greedy hearts. They had The scriptures say they went to bed dreaming of a plan of wickedness. And by the next morning, they would wake up and they would put that plan into action. They were oppressing their very own. They were oppressing the poor. They were stealing their land, their homes, their inheritance, and taking it by violence. They seemed like, like they were enemies. Their own people seemed like enemies to them. And so they were robbing, taxing, inflation, and they left the widows and the fatherless homeless. Seems a lot like where America is today, doesn't it? There was corrupt priests and prophets who would minister if the price was right. You give them enough money and they would tell you what God said. Just enough to tickle your ear and allow you to live right where you wanted to live. They twisted God's word if the price was right. This was an abomination before the Lord. It says the rulers judged for reward, priests taught for a hire, and prophets divined for money. So to put the cherry on top, in Micah 3.11, after all this, after Micah, if you remember, what does Micah's name mean? Who is like God? So every time they see this prophet going before the nation, here comes. Who is like God? He's going to remind us what we're doing wrong. And so that's what he was doing. And so here he comes in Micah 3.11. He says, after all, he pronounces the judgment of God upon the people. And, they, and he replies, yet they will lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. They felt entitled because they were God's chosen people. And we talked a lot about that last week. They felt entitled and felt that they could do no wrong. They felt that in their sin that they were God, they were deserving of God's immunity, his protection from his wrath of judgment. They felt like they deserved God's grace and his mercy despite their rebellion, despite their sin. God says, oh, we can't have that. Well, that's Old Testament, Tanya. Well, okay, let's fast forward to New Testament. When Christ is on the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, you ought to read that chapter there. 
And uh, he tells us to, or, well, see, wait a minute. That's, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on. Matthew 6, when he says, no man can serve two masters. So we can't serve two masters, for either one will hate the one, love the other, or else will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. So we know that today the church sometimes lives under the same impression. That the church, I'm talking about the church in today's world, is much like the society that Micah was living in. That the church pats sin on the hand and says, it's okay, honey, God yeah. loves you. But they forget about his wrath. They yeah. forget about his judgment. They forget about him wanting us to live a life of righteousness, that we are servants of righteousness, right? So we need the message of Micah brought to our nation today. So in the time of Micah, their sin had polluted the land and God had entrusted it to them and they disobeyed his commands by keeping their hearts unpure before, <coughs> them, before, before the Lord. So, uh, so because they mistreated, they sinned and they were taking from God's people. God is now about to take from them. He says, my judgments come upon you. I will send your enemies against you. And we will continue that story next week. But I want to go where God has led us at today, where his heart is for us today. And I promise our hearts will be encouraged because God just knocked my socks off with his Holy Spirit this morning. I could not get Roger to drive fast enough. Usually I tell him to slow down. I, I wanted everyone out of the way. I just wanted to get here and teach what the Lord has for us. But there is a penalty for sin. And we have to repent of that sin. If we plan on making it to be with God in heaven, right? I want us to reflect back on Micah 2, 4. It says, In that day, Shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation? Micah is mourning here and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. God has taken their land away. They have sinned against him. That land was a blessing. Have you noticed throughout the scriptures? That with sin comes either the destruction or the banishment of land. If you notice that all three scriptures, think of Adam and Eve. The first sin. They had the perfect little garden, the perfect little world until sin came on. The fall of man and what God do? He cast them out of the garden even, right? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? What did he do with Sodom and Gomorrah? He destroyed the land that they were on. He destroyed the whole city and the people. By the way, the sin was homosexuality. That's still God's sin today. Men were craving men. Women were craving women. What about the days of Noah? How did God destroy the earth then? The flood of water. So sin pollutes land. If we go back, clear back to Leviticus 18, and I'm not going to read all that to you. If you want to go home and read it, go ahead and read it. But it speaks of the abominations before the Lord. And they were speaking these abominations. A lot of these were sexual sins amongst other sins. And God was saying in Leviticus 18.24, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomiteth Vomit out her inhabitants. God will visit sin. And not only, sometimes you want God to visit you. I want his presence in my life. But there are some times you don't want him to visit you because he's going to bring his wrath and his judgment. He's I'm going to visit that sin and we're going to deal with it. And if you do not repent, then you'll seek that, you'll get a penalty of that. There will be a punishment for that. So a bit of the history. Land was God's gift to his people. It was a heritage to his people. We touched a little bit on that last week. The land of Canaan originally belonged to the Canaanites. God kicked the Canaanites out, and that surface, at first thought, looking at that, it's like, wow, God, that's harsh. You kick these people off to give it to the people that you chose. But after all, he is creator, is he not? He can do what he wants. But the reason why he kicked them off 
was because they, he, but by the way, salvation, we had that lesson in Jonah, salvation is for all, he offers salvation to all. Mm -hmm. But these was a wicked, wicked, a wicked uh, nation, and he kicked them off the land because they defiled the land in their sin. Blood sacrifice, and we can go on and on and talk about that. So he gave it to people, but in that, he says, but there's conditions that go with that. You have to be obedient. You have to have that righteous walk. Do my commands. Do what I ask you to do. Honor me. Worship me. Don't have no other idols before you. So Israel, in her constant rebellion against God, lost her portion of the land. She gave up her rights when she trespassed against God. Hence, in Micah, we see that God is bombing out Israel and Judah for their sin. He said, you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. So I'm spewing you out and punishment comes. And we'll talk about what God does in the future uh, next week, okay? But God demands a righteous living. Micah 6, 8 says, He, talking about God, has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require? Wait, the Lord requires something of me. What is it? Micah's going to tell us. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. To love mercy, do justly, walk humbly before God. The people in Micah's day were proud. So proud that they thought they were above God. They felt entitled as God's people. We also had that lesson last week, didn't we? It says walk humbly, do what's right. God demands righteousness. And if we go to Matthew chapter 5, when God is teaching the Sermon of the Mount, Christ's words are speaking. He's in, it's in red, so he's speaking. It says, <coughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the what? Earth. So if you look through all the Old Testament and all this about God giving this land, there's a foreshadowing here that we see. Those those who remain humble and righteous before God will inherit the future kingdom of God, his earth. That's, that means us too, by the way, if you haven't caught on to that. He said we have something to inherit. He, he has a future for us. He has a, a land that's coming that is his peace, that is righteous. His people, all nations, will flock to his temple, wanting to learn more and more about God. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, amen. That day has yet to be fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled. <clears throat> Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If I hunger and I thirst after the things of God, he promises to fill me. And not when I'm filled, I'm going to overflow. And boy, when I overflow, someone else is going to get a little splash of those blessings. When we're filled, we're fruitful. That's what Serve in the tabernacle of God. 
to their portion was the Lord. Wherefore the Levite had no part nor inheritance with his brother, but the Lord is his inheritance. That's what the scriptures the Lord is in the, his inheritance. And I couldn't help but think of David. And because he says the same thing. And if you want to turn with me to Psalms 142, do that for a second so I can catch my breath just for a session. Psalms 142. I often, when I'm discouraged and I need uplifted, I go to this chapter. It has fed me so many times and gave me strength and reminded me of who my portion is. But Psalms 142. Here is David. He's hiding in a cave because he's running from King Saul. And uh, King Saul was uh, his best friend Jonathan's father. And Saul was very jealous of David. He was jealous of the blessings that David had upon him. That's a whole other lesson that we could go into, but that's not the lesson for today. So here we find David in a cave. And I want you to get this. I want you to listen to this. How many here are going through a trial? You don't have to tell me what it is. Just raise your hand. I am. Yeah, quite a few. About half the crowd. Yes. Half the crowd here. How many here have a need? How many here need to be reminded of God's power? Yes. yes. Okay. This is for us. Psalms 142. Now this is David. He's at the depth of his despair. He said, I cried unto the Lord. And boy, did Doug not do a wonderful message last Sunday about how we are to cry unto the Lord. When you're crying unto the Lord, well, he's going to hear you. It says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint <coughs> before him. I showed before him my trouble. God, this is my trouble. And I'm giving it to you. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. How many here feel a little overwhelmed in today's society? Yeah. I can say that I do. Yeah. And when we are dealing with those trials each and every day, we get overwhelmed. He said, my spirit is overwhelmed within me. Then thou knewest my path. I love that one right there. No matter how overwhelmed we are in our spirit, God says, I already know right where you're at. But I still want you to come to me. I want you to trust in me. I want you to cry to me. I want you to bring me your trouble. What is it that overwhelmed you? In the way wherein I walked, have I, they privately laid a snare for me. David here is talking about the enemies. Now listen to where this is in, we're in David's mind and in his heart. I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. There is no man in this dark cave that knows anything about where I'm at. But the Lord knows where I'm at. He just said that. I'm overwhelmed in my spirit, Nancy, Bob. I'm overwhelmed, but God says, I know right where you're at. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I love how God works us over the last month. I've heard several testimonies, Judy one of them, I think Gary was the other, that they had these issues going on and they didn't know it, but because this happened, they went to the doctor and found this episode and that's what's being dealt with. God already knows. Joy, I just seen you. Welcome. I just seen you in the crowd. God already knows right where you're at before you even knew it. Yes. Right. Is that not wonderful? Right. He knows. So David says, I looked to my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me. There's no one here to save me. No man cares for my soul. Have you ever got to that place? We know better. We know better. As Christians, we know better. Ah, oh, woe is me. I'm in this situation. Yeah. No one understands where I'm at. Yeah. No one understands what I'm going through. God, I'm not even sure if you understand what I'm going through. But he does. He just said he does. David again says, I cried it to thee. He's not giving up. He's determined to get through to God. And I love this. Oh, Lord, I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Yes. My portion. We're on the land right now, and I believe y'all are living. Right. Yeah. Going through troubles, maybe overwhelmed, but we got breath in our lungs. Yeah. We are in the land of the yeah. living. And David says, even if I have no one that cares for my soul, even if there's no man that understands what I'm going through, even if I have no place to rest my hand, head other than this black cave, you're my portion. Yeah. I am in your presence, Lord. Yeah. God, give me your presence every day. Yeah. Yeah. Your presence. Lord. Yes. Wow, I feel his Holy Spirit. 
low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Sometimes we get so overwhelmed, you may not have someone chasing after you. Or maybe you do. But sometimes when you get so overwhelmed, and listen to this, one of my favorite parts, he says, bring my soul out of prison. Listen to this. That I may praise your name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountiful with me. He's already claiming that God is going to come to his rescue before God comes to his rescue. Yes. And I'm going to prove it to you here in just one second. Because if we flip over to the story, to 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 and 2, this, oh, I actually I'm going to do it right now. It says that God sends 400 men to David, and David becomes captain of God sent 400 men to that dark cave where David was at. Mm -hmm. Now listen to this. This tickles me. What kind of men did he send to them? This is going to take you a little by surprise. Uh, 1 Samuel 22, 1 and 2. David therefore departed this and escaped to the cave of Adelon. And when his brethren and all the father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. That means when he, David was in the cave crying, God was working on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now listen to this. And everyone that was in distress, hmm, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented, I don't know if this is encouraging or not, this is who you're sending me, Lord? Distressed, in debt, and discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became captain over them, where there was about him 400 men. I got so blessed because I couldn't help but think, <laughs> as Mary and Mike, I hope you're listening right now, they may feel like they're in a dark cave. Both you may feel like you're in a dark cave. As a matter of fact, it looks like the devil gave you a black eye this morning. And Judy, you may feel like you're in a dark cave. Katie, with your daughter, there's a lot of the Lord, what do we need this morning? But I thought that Mary Mike is going through fighting for the fourth stage of cancer. And they have been through it for several, several months. But I see that God sends well over 400 people because there's church after church after church that's sending them in their dark cave. Yes. But that cave's not very dark because there's light. And by the way, we have troubles. Some of us are in debt. Some of us are in distress. But by golly, yeah. it is those people who make the best prayer warriors. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. And 
Lord. Yes, there yes. is. Amen. Amen. I need breath this morning. God has done so many wonderful things in his name. Look at all these. Look at all these right here. Answered prayers. Answered prayers all over the place. Answered prayers sitting yeah. right here. Yes, yes. amen. Yes. Yeah. Bob, you may not have been here this past week. Mike's not supposed to be here, but he is here. Not here, but he will be here. He's here. He's alive, you know what I'm saying? There is none like you, Lord. But the Lord is true. He is the living God. Yes. We don't serve someone dead. Right. I don't serve a dead God. Right. I serve a living God. Yes, amen. Thank God I serve a living God. And His truth. The devil will come to I and tell me his life. God says, uh -huh, I got the truth for you right here. And He's an everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. We need today to be reminded of God's power. Yes. We need to come to church prepared and ready to worship and serve him. And whatever he calls us to do throughout the week, let us be obedient. Yes. Yes. Let, yes. Us, let us walk in his righteousness. Yes, amen. If we have sin on board, God's going to come visit it. He promises that. If you don't recognize the signs of the time, you're blind and you're deaf and you're mute and everything else. Amen. God will rescue his people if we repent, if we remain righteous, if we remain obedient to what he calls us to do. It's not about me. It's not about your pastors, your other teachers. It's not about you. It's about him. Yes, right? amen. Amen. And we're to be a light before the people. Yes. The wicked nation that before us, we're to be a light. That's what Judah yes. was called to do, to be a light. And they failed in so many ways. That God's gracious and merciful, but don't let that mistake that he will visit sin and deal with it. They are coming in. That was perfect timing. I love you. Who is like God? There is none like God. Yes, I love you all. Yes, amen. Amen.